Hey everybody. So this is the June bonus video for my subscribers to the newsletter, which is available on my website. So for those of you watching it next month, when I make it public to everybody, please go get subscribed at jarensimmons.com and that way you will get the early access to these bonus videos that are a little bit more informal, a little bit longer form than my normal weekly videos there on philosophy for where we find ourselves. So I uh, hope you will hop in with the rest of us as we think together a little bit earlier than we make it available to the public. For those of you who are subscribers, and so getting this video on June 1st, right when it is released, thank you so much again for being part of this community with me, for thinking with me, and for um, navigating what are sometimes a little bit more technical videos that I make here as part of the newsletter than those that I'm trying to make a little bit more for broader consumption in my regular weekly offerings. All right, so in this video, what we're gonna do is think a little bit together about the way revelation works. And by revelation, I don't mean you know the book of revelations in the Bible. I mean the way that we receive the world, the way that we are opened up to the world and it gives itself to our consciousness in particular ways. So let's start with a couple examples. These are things that I expect most of you have experienced, have navigated, have lived through uh, one way or the other. So first, you're walking into a building and you make your way through the front, through the hallway, into an office or a classroom, say, and you sit down in a chair. And then if asked, you almost don't remember ever opening any of the doors that you walked through to get where you are. This is something that for those of you who, like me, I'm getting ready to turn 46 this summer, but grew up driving manual transmissions uh, you or stick shifts, right? You may remember those experiences where you would be driving for miles and not even ever remember having shifted gears. What's going on in those circumstances? Well, compare that to a different kind of example. You are walking into that same building and on your way in, you bump into the door because it's locked. Or while you're driving the car, you try to drop it down into second gear or go up into third, but you slip the clutch, it grinds the gears. Suddenly you are very aware of the thing that you formerly had somehow remained oblivious to, you hadn't even thought about. Well, this is meant to get us to think about an example that we see from Martin Heidegger. Martin Heidegger, a 20th century phenomenologist, a German thinker, uh, often associated with existentialism as well, though I think that that misses really where he rightly stands in the history of philosophy. Though he certainly is concerned with existentialist themes, he is a phenomenologist at his core. He's thinking in light of the German philosopher Edmund Husserl, who is often recognized as the father of phenomenology. And Martin Heidegger, in his famous early book, Being in Time, presents what he's doing as effectively thinking about what it means to be the beings that we are, but the method by which he does this is explicitly the phenomenological engagement with the way the world gives itself to our consciousness as experienced in the first personal perspective. So how is it that we experience what we experience in the way that we experience it? This is fundamentally the Heideggerian question in order to think about who it is that we are, how meaning works for beings like us. So Heidegger takes examples like walking into the door, grinding the gears, but he looks at the example of hammering a nail into a board. I don't know uh, about you, but this is something that I used to do quite regularly growing up with a dad who um, loved making things and building things. And so I learned to hammer nails from a very young age. And again, this is one of those practices like opening doors or shifting gears that when things are going as they normally do, you're not even paying attention to hammering the net. You're just grabbing one, knocking it through, grabbing, knocking it through. You're not thinking explicitly or, or reflectively about the functioning of the hammer as a particular kind of tool. 
in relation to a context of meaning by which the world signals itself as presented to you as usable, <laughs> right? That's not what's going on. You're hammering a nail. But then what happens? The nail slips, you smash your thumb. Or the hammer breaks, right? You hit the nail and the wooden stem of the hammer, the handle of the hammer just snaps. Or what happens maybe more often is that you're hammering the nail and the nail bends. Well, in all of these different circumstances, we find ourselves confronted with the revelational potential of that encounter, of that object. Just like we notice the door when it does not open, we notice the shifting of the gear, we pay attention to it when it doesn't happen smoothly, we suddenly are made aware, we are revealed the hammer in its equipment nature, in the way that it functions as a tool for us for particular ends that are significant in relation to our context and horizon of lived meaning. When that hammer breaks, suddenly we see the hammer as a tool. But how do we do this? Well, we see it as a tool precisely because it now is sucking at being a hammer, right? The door is failing to be a good door and letting me through. The gears are failing to do what gears are supposed to do when I exert my effort and simply slide into the next one so that I can continue forward. When the hammer breaks, says Heidegger, we see the hammer. It reveals itself to us. But this, of course, you might say, well, that's ridiculous. I wouldn't have picked up the hammer to use it if I didn't see it as a tool. Heidegger's point is not that suddenly we understand that it is capable of hammering nails. It's that we see the hammer in its mode of existence, its mode of being. It reveals itself as equipment precisely when it fails to do the work of being useful, right? So when it struggles to be a good hammer, we see its equipment mode of being as basically falling out <laughs> right when the hammer no longer achieves that being itself. It doesn't do what it's made to do. Now, why would any of this be significant or important? It sounds like the kind of abstract stuff that professional philosophers get all hopped up about. This, I think, is actually really, really important relative to our lived experience as finite beings expecting future things. We are beings that age. We are beings that grow. And what that means is we don't simply expect, we also have to live on the other side of the experience of the expected occasion. Right now it's the beginning of summer, so we're super excited about the summer. I'm getting ready to do some downhill mountain biking. My son's going to camp. My wife is stoked about getting to the beach. She's less excited about the mountain biking. These are things that are animating our current days as we propel forward, making sense of where we're going as giving meaning to where we are, right? Today is a week from the biking trip. Today is a month from the beach trip. But notice, we go on the trip, we do the thing, and then there's the end of the thing. We come back from the vacation. We go back to work on a Monday. We return to the fall semester once the summer break has ended. So living in light of expectation is in fact living in relation to the terminus or the limitation of those experiences. They are going to end because we are the kinds of beings who do not live forever. Now, of course, we can expand this out and talk about it as our very existence, which Heidegger does when he talks about being toward death. We are both beings that expect a future and we are also beings that eventually die. So how is it that we can make sense of that existential quandary, that existential quagmire of expecting and then in many ways regretting the end of that which we expected? How do we learn to navigate that more effectively simply by reflecting on walking into doors and breaking our hammers? Well, this week I uh, was going mountain biking and on the way back, 
got back to where I was uh, headed. I was over at my parents' house and I realized the bikes on the back were leaning really weird and I couldn't figure out what was going on. Went back there, I was like, that's not right. They were slammed way up against the tailgate of my truck. And when I looked, I realized that the metal where the bike rack sort of holds and it stays level, the metal had absolutely sheared in half. The whole bike rack had basically snapped and bent upward. The metal had broken. It had bent to the point where it was no longer usable. Well, I was immediately frustrated. I was angry. <laughs> this means now I've got to go back to using a tailgate pad, which is still fine, but it kind of rubs the bike in weird places. It creates some wear on the frame. And it's also a pain to use. I have to take off my tonneau cover. I've got to put it on and off every time. It doesn't protect from rain if I'm carrying anything in the bed of my truck. So I was very annoyed. And moreover, bike racks are not cheap. So I'm also seeing this as the instigation of a big expense having to deal with this. But when all of this was occurring, <laughs> I actually said out loud, oh, you suck as a bike rack. <laughs> and in doing that, right, I'm channeling this Heideggerian awareness. The bike rack showed itself in its equipmentality as a bike rack, as facilitating me getting to the trails, being able to ride bikes. It sucked at doing its job. It broke. But, <laughs> and here's the, the question, the temptation, the, the challenge. When I realize and am open to the revealed existence of the bike rack as a tool that now has shown itself in its breaking down, do I now just stand in regret that it is broken? And moreover, do I now lose myself in the despair and frustration and anger at the fact of it no longer being the equipment that I need? Or do I maybe uh, receive a stoic invitation from a philosopher like Seneca who says we should live our life without regret? Well, if we do the former, right? We just get angry and frustrated and we regret the loss of this tool, this equipment, this thing. That makes a lot of sense and it's deeply human. So sometimes, again, this is not a bad thing. There are moments where just sort of being frustrated is important for us to be able to name the significance of the thing that we have now lost. But what if we move into that temptation offered by Seneca? If we say to live without regret does not mean never losing the bike rack, <laughs> never having the metal break, never having the hammer slip and hit our nail, never have the door not open when we turn the knob. Instead, living without regret means to cultivate, I would suggest, a life of gratitude for the fact that ordinarily, for the most part, in most cases, things work as they should. They do the things that we expect them to do, which is precisely why when they don't, when they suck at being the thing they're meant to be, we actually can notice that, right? That shows up for us as interestingly annoying because it normally disappears into the background of our experiences. Cultivating this gratitude, in my case, in relation to the bike rack, would effectively be realizing, now wait a minute, before I get too angry, before I get too frustrated, this bike rack was given to me by a friend. I didn't pay for this. I benefited from using it for over a year before it broke. So yes, I'm frustrated. I hate that I've got to now figure out whether to buy another one. But at the same time, wow, at that moment of the breakdown, the revelation of the gratitude that I may never have lived into adequately is also revealed. Did I every day appreciate the rack before the metal broke? Did I actually understand how awesome it is that cars continue to go forward and shifting gears is normally a thing that I do without running into trees? That doors protect us from the elements that they tend to work really well. Those appreciations, which again are super mundane, 
This is super lowbrow stuff, right? It's the very object nature of most of the things we encounter actually confront us now as opportunities for gratitude. But we tend not to see those as opportunities so long as they continue to work as they should. We just go about our life oblivious to the way that, in fact, they are serving purpose by facilitating our actions, our practices, and our experiences. So what if we cultivated gratitude as a way of life in light of the phenomenological awareness that revelation happens at moments of breakdown? And when that occurs, we have a temptation to regret, to frustration, and also a temptation, an opportunity, we might say, rather than temptation, an opportunity to celebrate that it hadn't broken down until then. Now, this is crucially related to our finitude in the fact that we always are going to have an end to the summer camp, an end to the vacation, an end to the summer break, an end to the metals integrity on the bike rack, an end to the functionality of the hammer eventually, that doors eventually need replaced, cars eventually have to get sold and new ones bought. And in the same way, and again, notice we're going from the mundane to the very significant, but the point remains, Everyone we love is going to die. Everything that we hope to do, even if we do it all, will eventually be in the rearview mirror. Our projects, our futures, our possibilities all have an expiration date. This again could be cause of frustration and anger and, and annoyance and despair. The existential dread about which Heidegger and others <laughs> talk, right? That we are anxious about the very fact that we are not infinite. Or we can grant that that is something that is still in play. It's not inappropriate, but it doesn't have to have the last word. We can actually realize that part of the glory of the relationship of love, part of the beauty of my relationship with my son, part of what is amazing about being able to be 45, turning 46, knowing that I'll never turn 20 again, <laughs> knowing that 60 is ever closer. These relationships, these experiences that are so deeply embedded in our embodied finitude, these are also opportunities for us to think really well about the fact that it's the contingency that gives some of the depth of meaning. Joy, says C.S. Lewis, is something inherently connected to the loss, the grief, the difficulty of dealing with the death of another. This again is kind of a hard idea, but it's very simple philosophically. And that's why I'm trying to think about broken metal <laughs> bike racks and bent nails and bruises from walking into a door as exposing to us this paradox, this, this important connection between the revelation of what we so often take for granted and the necessity of our finitude being an occasion for gratitude now. Yes, we can hope things go differently. Yes, we can hope to get through the week so we can enjoy the weekend. Yes, we can look forward to the thing that is coming but don't forget to be grateful that right here and right now, our future is defined relative to those expectations. And that's pretty cool. And then if it rains and we can't get out and do the thing we wanted, if the restaurant is too full and we can't get a table, if the car breakdowns and we're not sure how to afford a replacement, those are things that we will figure out because we are the kinds of beings who never, never were deceived to think that we would have it forever. The temporal duration of human experience is something that conditions gratitude as a way of life. This is why the Stoics encourage us to live without regret, but never to forget the fragility of all that we do. The same is true in our moral lives as in our existential lives. Goodness, virtue, justice, 
are things we must continue to cultivate and be grateful for the opportunity to live faithfully in relation to those goals. So, do hammers break? Yes. Does injustice occur? Absolutely. Does death threaten? Always. But in the meantime, may we understand that the revelation of brokenness, of phenomenological breakdown, is also the opportunity for gratitude as a way of life, of living without regret because we live on purpose today. I hope that's interesting. I hope it's helpful. I know it's something that I've been thinking a lot about, especially this week, being super annoyed by my bike rack. So maybe a little bit of Heidegger, a little bit of Seneca can uh, encourage you this month as you live into summer and also in awareness of the idea that summer is going to have to end at some point. All right. Again, if you're watching this in June, thank you for subscribing to the newsletter. Please reach out, make comments. I would love to engage with you. And for anyone else, if you're watching this in July, once I make it public to everyone else or <laughs> later than that, if it's uh, been on YouTube for a while, thank you for watching it all. Go to my website, jarensimmons.com and get subscribed to the newsletter so you can be part of these conversations as soon as they occur. All right, see you next time, everybody, unless a panel falls on our heads. <laughs>